All right, all right, all right. Y'all ready for some climate science? I am sorry, I cannot hear you over the sunshine out here. Are you ready for some climate science? Okay, great. Thank you so much, y'all, for showing up for this edition of Climate Science on Tap here at Optimism Brewing. Tonight's topic, climate optimism. And who couldn't use a little bit of optimism? My name is Sean McDonald. I am a research scientist and lecturer at the University of Washington in the program on the environment. And as, I'm, as always, I am your host tonight. We have a great panel. If you wouldn't mind giving, helping me give them a big round of applause. First, we have Zoya Tierstein from Grist. Great. We also have Representative Joe Fitzgibbon from the 34th Washington Legislative District. And you're going to have to be really loud because Greg hasn't actually made it here tonight. He's probably outside somewhere. So be really loud for Greg Rock of Carbon, Washington. He probably heard you. And last but not least, Megan Smith from King County Climate and Energy Initiative. Okay, so for those of you who have not been with us before, we're going to go ahead and start off with some comments from our panel. And then we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. So keep your questions in mind as you listen to our speakers tonight. So I want to start, though, by talking a little bit about what got us started on this topic of climate optimism, right? I mean, we don't really think about optimism too much when we think about the climate. But one thing we do know is that we do need hope and we do need optimism if we want to make any progress towards a better future, right? Hope and optimism are the bridge that get us from where we are now to the future. So I, I really like this quote from Naomi Oreskes. She's a professor at Harvard, historian of science, co-author of Merchants of Doubt. We've blown it, but pessimism is not acceptable, primarily because we need that hope. And so our panelists tonight are going to talk about what gives them hope from their respective fields. And so I'm not going to take up too much more time. I'm going to turn it over to them so they can tell you a bit about what they do and what gives them hope, what makes them optimistic about the future. But before I go too much further, I want to tell you a little bit about Cascadia Climate Action and Climate Science on Tap. Cascadia Climate Action is all about action, as the name implies. And so we are going to have some actions for you tonight. The first action, the most important action, is to ask questions. So it's your job, your first job is to ask questions tonight. You can ask questions of each other, you can ask questions of our panelists, and you can ask questions of the tablers who are here to help out later on. If you want to ask a question of our panelists tonight, please, please, please make sure you write down your questions on these yellow note cards that are scattered around at all of the tables. There are pens and note cards if you need another note card because you are a prolific question writer, that is okay. Just raise your hand. Our volunteers, volunteers with Cascadia Climate Action will bring you more note cards. So please, please, please write down those questions. We will pass those on and get them answered by the panelists during our Q&A. Second, please visit CascadiaClimateAction.org. It's your one-stop shop for all things related to climate action in our area. CascadiaClimateAction.org hosts a calendar. Mary Menos, the founder, who is out here in the audience somewhere. Mary. Mary, raise your hand. Mary's right there. Big hand for Mary. Mary updates that calendar all the time. There's all kinds of great information, ways that you can get involved. Last but not least, before you leave, I'm going to be watching you all to make sure that you visit at least one of the tablers over here to learn about how you can take action to protect the climate. So please visit our tablers. I'll be watching all of you. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker tonight. Each one of our panelists is going to give you five minutes on what makes them optimistic as it, as it regards climate change. Our first speaker, Zoya Tierstein, is a politics reporter from Grist. 
Zoya writes on climate policy for Gris, a leading online environmental news publication. Her reporting covers the current events, public figures, policy discussions, and scientific trends that drive the public interest in climate issues. From ticks to presidential hopefuls. You can find her work on PBS, The Verge, Mother Jones, HuffPost, Slate, and elsewhere. So let's give it up for Zoya Tierstein. Thank you so much for being here. Can everyone see what's on this uh, screen? No, okay, cool, I don't need it. <laughs> I only have three slides anyway. Uh, okay, well thanks again so much for being here. I do need to remember what I actually had on those slides. Can you guys hear me okay? No. Can you hear me now? Great. Okay, uh, I'm so excited to be here tonight because I need to talk about climate optimism or else I'll lose all hope. Uh, as a climate journalist, I write about a lot of very depressing things that um, make me feel at times desperate um, and other times horrified. Uh, but there is reason to be hopeful, and I mean that as a critical person who thinks critically about what solutions are, are really possible. And the reason that I believe that is uh, first, you still can't hear? It's, I feel like it, if it's any closer, I'll eat it, but okay. Can you possibly go to the first slide and I'll see if I can see it. So the reason why I know what's going on in the optimistic climate space is because I write a newsletter called The Beacon every day. And in that newsletter, I highlight uh, one good news item and a few bad news things. The, the good news is called The Beacon, the bad news is called The Smog. And in the good news, I look at what's going on. So one of the coolest things that I've noticed recently is that a lot of states across the US, despite the fact that President Trump has withdrawn or has declared that he will withdraw from the Paris Agreement, a lot of states are committing on their own to climate action. They're setting 100% renewable energy targets. Um, a lot of state attorney generals are suing the Trump administration over a slew of rollbacks that he's proposed. The AGs, the Attorney Generals, are sort of the last line of defense between Trump and, and the environment. And so that's been great to see all the amazing uh, action that's happening at the local level, at the state level, to enact change. How's the sound volume right now for you guys? It's all right? I learned. OK, next, please. The other trend I'm hopeful about, so this, this young lady who you can't see is named Isha Clark, uh, and she, uh, kind of went viral after confronting Diane Feinstein, the uh, senator from California, over climate change. Uh, Feinstein did not want to support the Green New Deal as these young people uh, conceive it. And uh, so they showed up en masse to her office in California and demanded that she uh, basically push a more, a more effective and a more comprehensive climate plan. And at the end of it, uh, Feinstein basically offered this young lady a internship. Uh, she's still figuring out whether she wants to take it or not, but uh, she's, I, I'm, I'm inspired by the youth and what's going on. I am the youth, but I'm also inspired by the youth um, because I think they've brought a new moral tenor to the argument about climate change, and they're basically trying to, to convince people that you know, it's not just a matter of polar bears, it's a matter of life and death for me. You're looking at the person who's going to be hurt by this. Um, so that's been inspiring to watch, and I'm hopeful about that. Next, please. And lastly, we have the Green New Deal and politics, which is my forte at Grace. So I write about politics, about all the different candidates who have come out with climate plans. That's five so far. Um, the best one has been by uh, a, a governor known as Jay Inslee. He's your governor, and he's done a really good job with uh, his climate platform. No surprise, he's running as the climate candidate. But Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Beto O'Rourke, uh, Cory Booker, those are the four who have released their own climate plans, and they're doing a really good job pushing for an insane target, a, a target that would have been unimaginable even in 2016. They want to go net zero by 2050. So in 2016, candidates spent a total of less than six minutes, five minutes and 27 seconds talking about climate change. Clearly, <clears throat> this election's a little different, and I'll leave it there. Great. Thank you so much, Zoya. All right, well thank you so much for getting us started thinking about 
the national stage and what's happening there. We're going to go ahead and bring it a little closer to home now. Our next speaker is Representative Joe Fitzgibbon. Representative Joe, with the 34th District, has made sustainability and greenhouse gas reductions a central tenet of his public service. Joe has been a longtime proponent of harmonizing the promotion of economic development and environmental protection in the Puget Sound region, with a focus on transportation solutions and land use policy. Prior to his election to the legislature in 2010, he served as the chair of the Burien Planning Commission, and now he is the chair of the Washington House Environment and Energy Committee. So let's go ahead and give it up for Joe Fitzgibbon. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. It's great to be talking about climate optimism. Um, and I will tell you, I've been, I've been in office for nine years. And in years past, I would have come talk to you about optimism as something where I'm, I'm hoping to get to in the future in the Washington State Legislature. For the first time in the nine years I've been in office, I can point to what we actually passed into law this year as reasons for optimism. I'm optimistic because of what we've already done and how much momentum that shows that we have in this state to really become one of the leaders of the country. And I think we are already one of the leaders. I want us to be the leader in terms of showing that we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions in this state to a safe level, which we're a long way from, uh, but that we can reduce those to a safe level and at the same time invest in our economy me, grow jobs, uh, ensure a just transition for the workers and the, the most highly impacted communities that experience those frontline impacts of climate change. Um, we didn't get everything that we needed to do this year. If I had to give us a grade, I'd give us a B, you know, which is a lot better than the previous eight years when I would give it us a, an F or a D. Um, at the top of the list, we passed a law, as a number of other states have passed, to move our state towards 100% clean electricity. We are now on track to have all coal out of Washington electricity by 2025, and we're going to be completely carbon neutral in our electricity sector by 2030. That's an amazing achievement. And unlike a lot of the states, including our very good friends in California, our very good friends in California for whom that 100% clean goal is a target, ours is not a, just a target. Ours is a standard. Utilities are going to have to actually demonstrate their compliance with this standard. We're going to have a completely carbon neutral electricity sector in this state. That's just the one highest profile, biggest impact of the bills. It is not the only bill that we passed this year that will make a big impact on our greenhouse gas uh, emissions as a state. Something else that I'm personally very proud of because it was my bill and it was a, you know, my biggest greenhouse gas achievement uh, you know, of my own so far was a bill to totally phase out hydrofluorocarbons in our state. Hydrofluorocarbons are a chemical used in refrigeration 10,000 times more powerful of a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. 10,000 times. Currently it's 4% of the state's emissions. If we did nothing about it, it would rise to 8 or 9% in the next 10 years. We are the first state to pass a law through our legislature saying we're going to phase out these chemicals, these highly, these super polluting refrigerants uh, as fast as possible. Some other states are also going to do it. They've been able to do it through their agencies, through their administrative process, their departments of ecology equivalents. California, Maryland, uh, Connecticut are doing that. Uh, but we were the first one to pass it all the way through the legislature. We know that because of the law that we passed through the legislature this year, signed into law, uh, other states are looking to get in line too. New Jersey, Rhode Island. We're, I'm going down to Oregon in two weeks to talk to Oregon about them joining the, the coalition of states that have chosen to act because the federal government has failed to act in order to solve this problem. We're not going to get optimism between now and 2020 from looking at Washington, D.C. in terms of policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We just know those are not going to be coming out of Washington, D.C. through the end of the Trump administration, which, God willing, is going to be in 2020. Um, you know, for the time being, we have to look to states and the local governments, and you'll hear from Megan about some of the great things that are happening here on the local level in King County. Um, Washington is positioning ourselves to be one of those leaders. We passed some laws that no other state has yet passed, like a building energy efficiency law. This one, we're the first in the country to pass a law requiring that large commercial buildings improve their energy efficiency, not just new buildings, because new buildings have to comply with modern energy codes, which are strong and you know, much stronger than for existing buildings. We're actually requiring that old buildings, commercial buildings, office buildings, hotels from the 1950s and 60s and 70s, when those en energy codes didn't even exist, actually 
achieve a performance standard that no other state has required so far. So that's something that we're the first in the nation on. And then finally, we enacted the nation's best appliance energy efficiency standard package so that for hot water heaters and for uh, light bulbs and for computers, for all kinds of products using electricity, they have to be the most efficient sold in the country. There are some aspects of those standards that other states have adopted. Vermont has adopted some, California has adopted some. We're the first state to adopt all of them. And then one aspect of that that I think that people, that, that it's easy to lose sight of, we're also requiring more water efficient appliances, toilets, faucets, uh, shower heads, and particularly for uh, faucets and shower heads, I think we, under, we, we discount how much energy is being used by hot water that we use both in our homes and in commercial buildings out in the world. Uh, by reducing the water that we use in, the, in showers and in washing our hands, that's actually a tremendous reduction in either natural gas or electricity use. In either case, that's a greenhouse gas reduction. So we're, we're going to have the best package of building efficiency and appliance efficiency requirements in the entire country. I'm encouraged. The optimism that I have today comes from the momentum that I feel that we have in Olympia to continue to make progress down that road. And the biggest area that we haven't made that progress yet, and we desperately need to because it's the biggest sector of emissions in this state, is transportation. We need to clean up transportation fuels. We need to require the, that gasoline and diesel uh, clean up their act and that the oil companies getting rich, or that are already rich, getting richer off of selling those fuels contribute to the solution by moving towards cleaner fuels that don't contribute so much to, uh, to climate change. And we need to accelerate our progress on building transit and having climate supportive housing policy. So building the housing that our state desperately needs because we have a housing crisis, building it in places that people can rely on transit, can rely on walking, can rely on biking uh, to meet their daily needs so that they don't have to get in a car every time they need to go to the grocery store, go to work, go to school, go to the hospital. Um, those are the areas that we need to do the most, and that's where I'm counting on you to help in order to keep that optimism going. Um, but for the first time in the nine years I've been in office, I feel like you know, not just oh, trust us, we'll get to it next year. I can point to what we've done this past year and say we're gonna, that's not gonna, this is not the environmental year. This is the first environmental year because we need a lot more legislative sessions like the one that we just had if we're ever gonna get to a point where our emissions are at a safe level. So, thanks. Thank you so much for that, Joe. I'm just gonna take one quick second because I think our panelist needs to settle in. You settling in? Great. Um, and just remind everyone, if you have questions for our panelists tonight, please, please, please write them down on the yellow 3 by 5 cards. Ideally, you would let me know who you want to have answer the question, too. So please, write out your questions for our panelists. Our volunteers will be coming by to pick those up. If you have a question already that you want someone to answer, just raise, it, raise your card in the air, and our volunteers will pick them up. So I think that our third panelist has settled in. I, I wanted to give him a second to catch his breath because I'm sure he walked here, right, from his destination. Wanted to be carbon neutral, right? So our next panelist is Greg Rock. He's policy chair for Carbon Washington. Greg is an entrepreneur, engineer, and climate activist. As a member of the board with an expertise in sustainable energy, he chairs Carbon Washington's policy committee which guides the organization's climate change advocacy strategy. Greg lobbies for carbon taxation and engages Republicans and rural Washingtonians in support of climate action. So let's give it up for Greg Rock. Hello, hello, and um, thank you all for being here. I'm sorry I was running late, one of those days. Um, oh, a little closer here. Everyone can hear him back? All right. Uh, so I want to start off a great introduction. Uh, as he said, I'm with Carbon Washington. Uh, one of the things that's a little unique about our organization uh, compared to some of the other climate organizations, we spend a lot of time trying to engage both political parties. Uh, I think everyone knows the Democratic parties are more willing to act right now on climate than the Republican Party. Um, it might be a surprise if that's, you know. Um, but there, there is some psychological issues that you've seen, we've seen develop. There's a lot of studies that talk about what might have caused the reaction that we see, this climate denial. Uh, and part of it, it's the solutions that we've been proposing. So if you have a core ideology that's opposed to bigger government, it's opposed to taxation, and your proposal is a regulatory policy that increases the size of government and creates new taxation, it's not surprising that they kind of disagree. Um, and what's interesting about the psychology vault is it is 
if you propose a solution that's there that doesn't conflict with their core ideology, it changes the climate denial from like a high 70% rate down to 32%. So that's an interesting dynamic. And we, we got started doing stuff in this field way back in 2016. We ran the first carbon tax initiative, I-732. Uh, some of you may have remembered, some of you may have gathered signatures. Um, it was a revenue neutral carbon tax. So it didn't grow the size of government, didn't create new programs, it just taxed the carbon and then reduced all of, used all the money to reduce the state sales tax. Um, and before I go on to what's kind of got, we've, where we've advanced since then, I want to take just a moment. I know you guys heard from Joe and all the amazing stuff that happened in Olympia, but I lobby down in Olympia for the last four legislative sessions. Uh, so I spent a lot of time working with Joe and other champions in the legislature on this issue. And what Joe has single-handedly pushed over the last decade, have you been down there? Decade is amazing. Because there aren't many champions on this issue. And you, there's a lot of people that might be votes. Um, but I think we need to be demanding from our legislators, especially in these really green districts, that we have champions on this issue. And Joe is the biggest champion of them all. So we should be really applauding again his effort. Um, and so where Carbon Washington has gone is we've continued to try to push on what does it take to get conservatives into the fight? Where can we meet them on policy that they're willing to go? And we did a little biochar memorial. And I don't know, has, how many people have heard of biochar before? Yeah, about 7%. <laughs> and guess what? You're doing better than the legislators. Uh, but not anymore, because we actually ran a biochar memorial. Uh, we were able to get Joe here to be one of the, the prime Democratic sponsor with, with a, a conservative that is a very interesting gentleman, Representative Shea. He's very conservative. Um, and it's not common to have these two on the same type of bill. Um, but that, what followed that was a, a slew of eight other Democrats and eight other Republicans that signed on. Now, this memorial didn't do anything. Uh, it just memorialized that we find biochar an interesting thing to study. And, and, it, and the, the real effort there was an educational effort. We're educating the legislators about what biochar is. It's a unique thing. It's carbon sequestration. You can hold it in your hand. And it'll be here for thousands of years. Um, but now we continue to expand on that concept. And this past year, we introduced the Sustainable Farm and Fields Bill. Uh, and this is a bill that looks at paying farmers and ranchers to take part in positive sustainability practices on the farm. And it ranks them based on how much carbon reductions they achieve, either in the emissions they create or the sequestration that they create. And it's very interesting because our rural communities are what are creating this vast quantity of sequestration and environmental benefits. Um, so we're starting to look at other policies too that are pairing a carbon tax with sequestration credits. So if you think about a carbon tax, everyone thinks we want to internalize the external costs, right? How many people think that's a good idea to do? We should definitely internalize the external costs of all the current polluters. Well, maybe we should be looking also at internalizing the external benefits that we're not currently rewarding for. So in our forests and our agricultural lands, we're not, they're not getting paid for the carbon sequestration they're creating. They're not getting paid for the soil erosion, the, the health, healthy air that they create. And so when you look at the dynamic politically, and technically, I'm an engineer, so I think technically, like we can't do this unless we're all pushing together. And so if there's policies that can speak to the rural part of our country and get them seeing the, the positives, recognizes what they're already doing, and maybe rewards them to do more things, um, then I think the tune of Republicans change. And I'm seeing that with reg legislators we've been talking to, even around fee and dividend. People know about fee and dividend, right? Uh, the, the citizen climate lobby, revenue neutral carbon tax at the federal level. We, we worked pretty hard with a bipartisan group about possibly introducing one in Washington State last year. Republicans were coming to the table for that discussion. Uh, now there's a challenge with that because it requires a constitutional amendment. Um, but if you had everyone on the same page, a constitutional amendment is only two thirds of both bodies. Uh, so I guess we're pushing at Carbon Wall for something a little different and I'm really optimistic that we're getting progress. Republicans are starting to get in the fight. And it's a part of just, you have to recognize what's going on around you. 
uh, but it's also part of getting solutions in front of them that they're willing to engage in and willing to act on. Say, oh, that's something I could do. Um, so that's really my optimism that I, I'm really encouraged about is where this goes as we start getting both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party pushing for climate action. All right, y'all. So again, before we get started with our last panelist introducing herself, I want to make sure that everyone remembers to fill out their little yellow cards. If you have your question already written out, you just wave it in the air. One of our volunteers will come by and grab those for you. OK, so our last panelist to introduce herself is Megan Smith. She's the director of King County Climate and Energy, Energy Initiatives. Megan leads climate change and energy initiatives across King County, convening cross-sector partnerships and driving community-level participation in shaping government policy. Prior to this position, she served as the King County Executive's environmental policy advisor and managed natural resource programs at the intersection of science and policy. So let's give it up for Megan Smith. Good evening. Well, I want to say a little bit about King County first, and I would ask, how many people here in the room are from Seattle? Live in Seattle proper. Okay, how many people live in an east side city here? Okay, so, so King County, we have 2.2 million residents, 39 cities. And something that makes me very optimistic about climate action here is we have a very strong coalition between King County and local governments to get our arms around community scale emissions. So this is fairly unique around the country. Most cities and most local governments are really focused on their operational emissions. So the emissions from the electricity they use in their buildings, the fuel they use in vehicles. But we know in King County, even if we do everything perfectly, we're about 1.7%, our operational emissions, about 1.7% of total across this county. So we absolutely have to work in partnership with cities to tackle things like transportation and land use and basically coming together to figure out how and where we develop it, develop, how we serve that development with transportation and kind of how we build our quality in life. Those are the things that are gonna make or break our success or failure on climate change. So when I say I'm optimistic, I'm optimistic because we have an eight year long collaboration with cities. Uh, we just added two, we're now at 16 cities plus the port and we represent about 80% of the county's population. So we have a really strong framework to tackle community scale emissions and that's pretty unique. Um, I will say that another thing that makes me very optimistic is just truly transformative state energy policy. So we cannot meet our climate goals without what Representative Fitzgibbon and our legislators have done this session. 100% uh, clean building energy efficiency, appliance standards, hydrofluorocarbons, we cannot do it without you. We love your changes so much that we've already done the technical analysis. This is hot off the press like today. I brought it on a board. That big blue wedge there is how much the 100% clean legislation will reduce our community scale emissions over time. The big red one at the top is building energy efficiency. Hydrofluorocarbons are in there too. So about half of the emissions, like our, our path to get to an 80% reduction by 2050 is dependent on things that are now in law. So thank you very, very much. Something else that makes me very optimistic, as I mentioned, this King County City's Climate Collaboration, we had a group of hardcore city elected officials join the county to go down and testify in support of these bills. Uh, we had representatives from Snoqualmie, Kirkland, Shoreline, Burien, Mercer Island, so cities around the county, plus King County going down and testifying for those bills. Um, and that's somewhat unusual. They really put a lot of effort into that. They really made it their priority for the session. Um, Something else that makes me very optimistic, and this is probably the nerdiest thing I'll say all night, is we are seeing a decoupling of population growth from community scale greenhouse gas emissions. So, wow, people know what that is, yay. <laughs> so I have another board about that. So what that's getting at is in the last 10 years, we've seen 16% population growth in county, 
we've seen a 15% reduction in per capita emissions. So glass half full, 15% emissions reduction over 10 years in per capita emissions. Uh, glass half empty with population growth. We're kind of just holding steady and starting to turn the corner on community scale emissions. So it tells us we have a lot more to do. Uh, the other thing it tells us is that growth management is like one of our number one climate actions we can take. Um, and my optimism was reinforced today. We, our county executive, Dow Constantine, convened our city partners today, all 16 of them, plus several who are potentially new members, got together, and they are saying, hey, we need to be really looking at transportation, land use, affordable housing, what those intersections are and what they do to our emissions. That would not have been the conversation five years ago. So that, that is huge. So that makes me very optimistic. Um, Last thing I'll just, well, second to last thing, I have two 13-year-olds, middle school. I went to the middle school science fair this week. I am compelled to act because I'm very concerned about our generation and the next generation, but those kids give me hope. The things that they are working on and thinking about at that age, middle school age, uh, that gives me hope. And I would say that you all turning out here gives me hope. Uh, it's a beautiful night. You could be out doing other things. Um, it, it heartens me to see you here. You could be out riding Trailhead Direct, our bus that goes out for you to be able to recreate in our beautiful forest lands. You could be doing lots of, you could be riding light rail. You could be doing all sorts of things. So thank you for being here tonight. Um, we do have a table set up here. I brought some of these posters with me. We have postcards there. We are updating our five-year climate plan right now. We would love to have your input into that. Um, so please take a postcard. You'll find out how to join our listserv. You can see our newly updated web page. Um, so thanks all, all of you for being here and look forward to questions. Great, thank you so much, Megan. That was fantastic. It's great to see and hear and see your board about what King County is doing right now. That's very exciting. Um, well, at this point, y'all, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to questions. And I think that Eden and some of our other volunteers are gathering those cards. Please raise your hand if you have a card. She will go ahead and, and our other volunteers will pick those up. Uh, this is a moderated Q&A. So if you want to have your question answered, please go ahead and submit your question to us. And I will go ahead and, and read those questions. We may not be able to get to all the questions tonight, but we will do our best to answer those questions and send out an email blast for any questions we cannot answer at this time. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with the questions. Um, I guess the, the first one is maybe for Zoya. Uh, let's, say, let's see, Democratic candidates for president from Joe Biden, Andrew Young, all across the board have come out with ambitious proposals for climate emission reduction. <clears throat> so do you really think then that we've turned the tide, that this is now a major issue that's going to take, maybe not center stage, but at least be a priority nationally? Um, yeah, I think, I think despite the fact that DNC will, is not hosting a, a climate debate, that um, climate change is very much in the zeitgeist and will remain there for a long time um, until it's either fixed or, or better. I think better is probably the logical outcome, um, I hope. Uh, but yeah, I think that, um, like I said, you know, in 2016, there was a very small amount of time dedicated to talking about climate change, and now it's, you know, if you don't have a climate plan, you're kind of left in the dust. Beto O'Rourke released a plan that went net zero by 2050, and Jay Inslee, I'm, I'm fairly certain, had that same target, but was one up a day earlier by Beto O'Rourke and changed it to 2045. So um, I think that uh, that's just my personal, it's my hunch, but, you know, it's not, not confirmed. Um, so I think, that, I think that it's here to stay, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that, some of which the, you guys will also talk about. Great. Thank you so much for that, Zoe. So here's a question actually for Greg from our audience. You mentioned this idea of internalizing external benefits. But uh, the question from the audience, the questioner suggests that farmers sometimes are opposed to the idea of subsidies, and that some conservative folks tend to be opposed to subsidies. And we're wondering how how they see this, uh, how this idea of internalizing external benefits, how that comes across when you talk to these more conservative audiences? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, 
I think it's a mixed bag. I, certainly the farm community is very used to subsidies. There's a large federal subsidy program that's already supporting them in a pretty significant way. Um, but they certainly is a mentality um, amongst them that they want to go their own. You know, they're, they're, they're out there, they're, they're supposed to be able to make it on their own. So they kind of don't like that they're dependent on the subsidies they're already utilizing. Um, but I think in general, money speaks at the end of the day in that conversation. Uh, so if there's the, the biggest issue right now with it is building trust that it'll be there. So, you know, you can say, oh, there'll be these credits, but then if the program gets shut down and those credits stop coming in and they've invested in equipment and they're expecting annual payments. Um, so it's, I think it's building that trust is a bigger issue right now than that we don't want any payments. But I will say the, the introduction of the Farm and Fields Bill uh, during the legislative session, we had a great sponsorship group. The, the leader of the Republican Party, Senator Schessler, was a, a sponsor, as was Senator McCoy, a longtime Democrat and Native American. Um, and, you know, that, that helped move it through the Senate quickly, but we ran into problems in the House um, because the Farm Bureau opposed it. And they didn't want to talk to their members about it. They, they, they were opposed to the idea, even, I mean, the best analogy I can say is there was a box of money, and they were opposed to it because it was wrapped in wrapping paper that said climate change on it. Um, so there still is that knee-jerk reaction, and I think if you look at all the campaigns against the recent initiatives in this state, Farm Bureau has played a major role in that. Um, so there is a more of an ideological battleground, more so than whether we will take the money or not. Yeah, interesting. Well, so this is, we're going to shift gears from farmers to tech, and this next question is for Joe. So. You mentioned of all of the things that are being done in the legislature, uh, the things that were passed this last legislative session. Question from the audience comes down to, you know, what are we asking of businesses in the states, so especially the large businesses like Amazon, Microsoft, et cetera. How, what are we asking them to do to sort of pony up and, and start thinking about emissions reductions as well? I don't know that there's anything that we've specifically asked of them that we haven't asked of everybody else. We know that Amazon, Microsoft, um, you know, our big tech companies in the state are big energy users, like every other big company, like, you know, as is Boeing, as is, um, you know, Starbucks or anybody else. Um, but certainly those tech companies, they have big server farms, uh, particularly in eastern Washington, but also in other parts of the country. Um, they're major energy users. Um, as they grow, they use more energy. And that's one of the things that's kind of put pressure on our electrical grid is as we have more of this cheap, abundant hydropower, which is one of the reasons we're one of a, you know, a lower emitting per capita state than, than some of our friends back east. Um, as those tech companies suck up more of that cheap, clean power, uh, that pushes overall, overall demand higher and, and creates a potential that we would build natural gas plants into the future. Um, by passing the law that we passed this year, the 100% clean electricity law, uh, we're ensuring that, that, that if there is new demand in the future, because the tech companies are using more energy to power their clouds and their databases and all that, that, that that's going to be clean power. So, um, yeah, so we haven't done anything extra for them beyond what we've asked for every energy user uh, at which every electric utility in the state, which is um, you're going to clean up your act. You can, you, know, you can grow, you can use energy, that's important. We, uh, we don't have a demand for fossil fuel, we have a demand for energy. And so as your energy demand grows, fine, but, but you can't use that, you can't uh, pass the costs on that to the rest of us through greenhouse gas emissions uh, and local criteria air pollutant emissions. Great, thank you for that. So this qu next question is for Megan, actually. Um, you mentioned the idea of decoupling population and emissions, and that's a, I, I think that's a really great thing that King County's doing. I'm curious if the same could be said for other counties in Washington State, or, and if, if not other counties in Washington State, how are we doing compared to other metropolitan areas in neighboring states? Uh, on the growth management front, I, I can't speak to growth management rates in other, King, in other counties. I'll say in King County, in the last several years, we're running about 97, 98 percent of new growth is in established urban areas. Uh, and so in the current uh, like Vision 2050 discussion, this is the regional growth plan for Central Puget Sound area. They're looking at kind of what are the preferred growth patterns, and one of them is transit-focused development. So you're trying to put about 70% of population employment near high-capacity transit. 
So that kind of direction is what we want to see happen, not only in King County, but in the region for sure, to kind of have that decoupling. What was the second part of your question? Yeah. No, what is well, the, the second, the second part? part of the question was about um, how we're doing compared to other major metropolitan areas. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess from a growth management standpoint, I'd say we're doing very well. When you look at per capita emissions, I actually have a poster for that too. We didn't plan this. She just brought her own posters. <laughs> All right. So if you look at a city like Portland, uh, when you look at how they're doing relative to their goals, they have made some really great progress and I think in some ways better than King County. When you look at their per capita emissions though, they are actually higher than King County. Uh, and they are higher than for city of Seattle. Uh, King County's per capita emissions are lower than for the state of Washington as a whole and certainly lower than the U.S. per capita emissions. So we've got a little information about kind of where we land. Um, we know that per capita emissions is very dependent on where your electricity comes from. So here in the Seattle area and Seattle City Light, largely carbon neutral electricity. Puget Sound Service Territory, about 30% coal still. So again, that clean electricity bill that passed this session will make a huge difference in those per capita emissions. Great, fantastic, thank you very much. So shifting back up to sort of the national stage, uh, it's a question about, about the news cycle and about the journalism that we see on a daily basis. Question from the audience, you know, we see, um, we see some stories that we're on track to reach 100% clean energy and others that say we're doomed to fail. How do we as the news consuming public reconcile the fact that we're getting, in some cases, conflicting news stories in almost the same news cycle about how we're doing in terms of reaching our emissions targets and if we even need to? I wish I, I knew the answer to that one. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of different kinds of information uh, out there and the truth is that there is good and bad news. And there are reports that say that, you know, we might have a, an ice-free Arctic by 2040. And there's also reports that show, wow, like look at, look at Washington State just passed this like whole suite of uh, renewable energy bills. I mean, that's huge. Um, what I can say is you should read grist.org. <laughs> we have uh, some smart people writing about it, not me, others. Um, and. And yeah, I mean, it, it's basically, you know, if you stay as informed as you can, it's what I do. I'll tell you what I do, which is that I just read a lot of stuff. And I, and I, and I don't focus on like, you know, Vice News has had a whole bunch of headlines recently that are like, we're totally screwed. And, and I read that and I'm like, well, you know, that, that may be the case, um, but there's also work underway and, and, and you gotta sift out the headlines that are more or less a little bit sensational and ones that have some, some, some grounding behind them and are, and are a little more serious about, about not that Vice News isn't, isn't totally serious, but, but read Grist, yes. All right, so the answer is read Grist and the problem will be solved. I like that. That makes it simple. Well, this was a question actually I think that Joe, you might be able to answer, Greg, you might be able to answer as well. Um, it's actually something I don't know that much about at all, but uh, the question from the audience is, why can't Washington become a full CARB, a CARB member state to mandate sales of electric vehicles? Uh, so I think what that's referring to is the California car, clean car standards. So there's, uh, California has a privileged position p under federal law when the Clean Air Act was passed because California had already taken really strong action to reduce their own emissions from vehicles because their air pollution was so bad. Um, they're allowed to go to be ahead of the rest of, the head of the EPA basically in terms of their uh, pollution standards for cars. And California took strong action back in the early 2000s to require more efficient vehicles. Uh, they required both that, uh, every automaker improve the efficiency of their fleet overall. That's the corporate average fuel economy, CAFE, um, under the, in the federal term for that is CAFE standards. Um, and then California had another part of their standards which specifically required that more electric cars be sold. Zero emission vehicles, which for all practical purposes means electric cars. It can also mean hydrogen cars, but there aren't very many of those. Um, there aren't any of those in Washington yet. There's a couple in California. Um, 
other states are allowed to adopt California's clean car standards, and about 15 states have done that, including Washington. Washington adopted California's clean car standards through the legislature in, I think it was 2006. It was either 2005 or 2006. Um, but they spe Washington, the legislature at that time, um, I was not there yet, but they specifically did not adopt the second part, the zero emission vehicle part. So we require that all automakers clean up the average fuel economy of the cars that they sell in Washington as much as they do in California and Oregon and in New York and Massachusetts and all the other states that have adopted that. But we don't have that second part where we require them, every automaker to sell a certain percentage of their fleet overall be electric cars. Um, and every other state that's adopted California standards has done that. So we're kind of an outlier in this. We're kind of in this weird in-between zone where we've done, you know, what I would consider the more important part of the clean car standards, but not the full meal deal. Um, and that, the, the legislation to get that through has not made it yet. We haven't had enough support in the legislature yet to fully adopt, to, to finish the job and to adopt the rest of the California clean car standards requiring that a certain number of electric vehicles or hydrogen vehicles be sold as part of each automaker's fleet. That's one of the things that I think is gonna be really high on the to-do list in the 2020 legislative session. Um, I keep you know we have we had all these sort of events to celebrate the great climate progress we made in in the 2019 session and the thing that just in the back of the thing that i was worried about and that i kept saying to everybody at, at all these at all these celebratory occasions was this can't be the last you know this can't be like oh this was our great environmental year you know what are we going to work on next year no we have to actually continue the level of commitment that we had to reducing greenhouse gas emissions in 2019 into 2020, and that starts with the things that we didn't get done in 2019. So the zero emission vehicle standards, which are one of the things that we didn't get done in 2019, have to be high on the priority list in 2020. Um, and so that is something that I think that we will get done next year. Um, ultimately, um, unless that zero emission vehicle requirement goes to 100%, we also need to clean up transportation fuels we need to require that transportation fuels not emit as much as they currently do, that, that a gallon of gas and a gallon of diesel cannot be the standard for what we accept for how much, it, it, how much energy it provides to move a, a vehicle. Um, and we have to reduce vehicle miles traveled. And we do that with uh, investments in transit, investments in bike pedestrian infrastructure, and in smart housing policy, like Megan talked about, where we um, encourage growth to happen in places where the infrastructure exists to support that growth, particularly the transit infrastructure, because that's what's gonna reduce vehicle miles traveled um, per capita and ultimately overall. Um, all those things need to be components of a transportation emission strategy because transportation is 45% of the state's overall greenhouse gas emissions, more than double the next largest, which is buildings. Um, so, all, so zero emission vehicles and all these other things all need to be part of our, our next uh, round of climate action in Olympia. Do you have anything to add, Greg? <laughs> it's hard to add to that. That's okay. expertise right there, huh? All right, that was great. <laughs> Um, well, so this next question, actually, something that I'm very interested in personally, I think a lot of people in this audience would be as well. Um, climate change is expected to disproportionately impact communities of color and other uh, underrepresented groups. Um, and this, uh, and these, these groups also already face economic disadvantage. And this is actually a question I think that, that all three of our panelists here on the end could, could talk about. Is what are you each doing in your respective positions to highlight the crisis in these communities and uh, what are we doing to find solutions that might uh, help with quality of life under future climate change scenarios as well? Okay, I'll start that one off. Um, so one thing we're doing as we both implement our, the climate plan we have today and update it is really take a close look at who is most impacted by climate change here in King County. And then as we develop solutions, who benefits from those solutions? And again, who is impacted? So one thing I put out on the table here, um, for years we had these infographics that would talk about the environmental impacts of climate change. And then we started saying, okay, well, what are more the human health impacts? Um, what are impacts to our economy? That was the next step. The next step beyond that was saying, which communities are most impacted by air pollution, by heat waves, people with pre-existing health conditions who have lower incomes to be able to respond to those things. Let's go to those communities and have them say, these are the problems that they face, these are the solutions they'd like to see. 
So kind of a first piece of that you'll see on the table uh, is infographics that were basically developed by communities who are impacted to put these are the impacts to them in language. Um, so that's, that's a first step. On the solutions front though, uh, we've made a commitment to transition to an all electric battery bus fleet by no later than 2040. That sounds a long way off, but that is actually fairly quick when you look at, you know, buses last about 15 years. Um, and when we were doing the analysis of, you know, we have these hybrid electric buses, do we stay with that technology or do we go to all battery bus? Do we go to something like natural gas buses? Um, we looked at it with an equity lens. So we said, where do we, again, have the worst air quality in King County? Where do we have the worst health outcomes? Where do we have communities of color? Where do we have low income populations? And we had already determined that it was technically feasible to go to battery buses. But we said, if we're gonna look at where we deploy those first, who should get those benefits first? So you will see the big scale build out of our first transit base to serve battery buses in South King County because we wanna have those buses there first. So we've been piloting some on short routes on the east side. The big rollout of those buses, so to speak, will happen in South King County. And we've done something very similar uh, when we do things like prioritize open space investments. We're looking at mapping out where do people have easy access to open space or green space in their community? Uh, where do they have access to places that are trees and are cool when those hotter days that we have in the summer? That influences our priorities today. Um, just from maybe an organizational standpoint, uh, Carbon Washington endorses a, a slew of different climate related bills every year. Um, this year we endorsed the HEAL Act, which was a Healthy Environment for All Act that was um, a, put forward by Front and Center, which is a social justice organization. And it's a pretty neat bill. The, the Department of Health has created a mapping tool where you can map all sorts of different economic disparities, exposure to local air pollution disparities, income disparities, uh, language barriers, it's just tons of stuff. It's a great tool to check out. Um, and what it does, it starts uh, requiring that all the agencies uh, take that mapping into consideration when they're figuring out their programs to address social justice issues, and also kind of stretch into and make sure social justice is included in a lot of topics where it's maybe not currently considered. Um, in engaging with Front and Centered and other organizations in that space, I think something that I've been hearing a lot is that it, the, the local point sort of source emissions is a key issue. Um, they, they can't support a cap and trade program because they feel like um, those emissions will get traded away and the, the big coal power plant that is next to their community is going to keep emitting. Um, and we do have a coal-fired you know, cement factory in downtown Seattle. Um, and the pollution from that and all of our pollutants, whether it's vehicles, um, especially trucks, is very loca location-based. The particulate matter that causes the respiratory disease and, and much higher rates of early uh, mortality is really proximity limited. Uh, so it's within a half mile or a mile, and, and the further you get away, the less impact it is. So it's those communities next to the trucking depot, next to the highway, next to that coal-fired power plant, um, where there's excess pollution and they're being dis disproportionately impacted. Um, and of course, those are normally lower-income communities, communities of color, and so it's a real issue. And so the mapping tool really helps, but I think we need to think through other policies about how we can try to clean up some of the trucking pollution that's coming into certain communities and some of those point source emissions. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to be quick to not repeat um, what Megan and Greg have said too much, but um, I think the HEAL Act that passed this year is an important step um, in terms of mapping what those sources, the disproportionate sources of um, of pollution are that impact uh, certain communities much more than others, clearly. Um, I think that the real prerequisite to um, tackling the disproportionate health impacts faced by uh, disadvantaged communities is to understand what those impacts are um, and to understand how to differentiate them because not all impacts are the same. Diesel particulate matter is a severe impact towards respiratory health. It's a carcinogen. Um, carbon monoxide, also not a very unhealthy pollutant that comes from, from the combustion of gasoline and diesel, um, that has a significant impact on infant mortality. 
Um, benzene, which comes from, you know, generally diesel in general for the criteria air pollutants, the, the, the health impacting air pollutants, diesel tends to be worse than gasoline, but one pollutant the gasoline emits that diesel doesn't is benzene, which is a severe carcinogen also, and it's one of the things that's responsible for that gasoline smell that, um, you know, that you get at an older gas pump. Um, and so understanding what those impacts are, how they're different from one another, how they impact different communities disproportionately um, is a prerequisite towards how are we going to address those impacts. And I think that the mapping that's going to happen as a result of that uh, legislation this year is going to help us understand that. Um, rural communities, which in this state, the most disadvantaged communities, the most poor communities, the communities with the worst health outcomes um, are in rural areas. Um, they Large, uh, many of them are on uh, Native American, on Indian reservations in our state. Those tend to be the, the least healthy parts of our state. Um, but also in areas like the lower Yakima Valley, which is heavily Latino. Um, those tend to be the places, and, and also in South Tacoma, where there, it's uh, you know, a, a very diverse mix of Latino, um, African American, um, white populations. So um, the rural areas, the impacts that they experience from climate change are less from the um, you know, the local air pollutants that Greg and I both talked about coming from the coal plant or from the vehicles, they, they're on the front lines of actually experiencing the impacts of climate change. Um, in Eastern Washington, now we all remember the smoke from the fires the last couple summers, a lot worse in Eastern Washington, I'll tell you that. And in addition to having the air quality impacts be worse, people are forced out of their homes, people lost their homes. And the people who are least able to get out of way, uh, get out, you know, to, to go stay in a hotel with air conditioning somewhere are people who are poor or people who like live off the land and can't leave their, you know, their entire life's work to, to be destroyed by a fire. So um, for them, Figuring out what do we need to do to adapt because we know climate change. We're not going to stop it tomorrow. We'd like you know we'd like to stop it, but we're not going to be able to stop those effects tomorrow. Um, for them, maybe adaptation is more important than reducing the the effects from the um, the primary source pollutants like the uh, the electricity production or the transportation fuels. Great, thank you so much for that. I just took a look at the time, and I, we could just keep talking on these topics. I'm sure we could, but I do want to be respectful of everyone's time knowing that it's already 8 o'clock. So let's just go ahead and get a big round of applause for our panelists tonight. I, I want to mention that we have a lot more question cards up here. We're not going to be able to get to those right now. So I would encourage you to stick around and ask questions of our panelists. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that they'll stick around for a beer with me and you can get some of your questions answered. Also, we'll take these questions and we will uh, try to get our, our panelists to answer some of them and we'll write them up and send them out in an email blast as well. Um, hopefully, you know, you had a chance to at least write down some of your questions or you'll have a chance to ask your questions. As I mentioned previously, please go to Cascadia Climate Action to find out about some things that you can do. And last but not least, I really want to make sure that you have an opportunity to talk to some of our tablers that are here tonight. I just want to run through a couple of them right now. Uh, Greg already mentioned he's from Carbon Washington. Carbon Washington is working to move towards uh, wa move Washington towards zero carbon emissions. And I think that we have somebody from Carbon Washington tabling. Do we? Oh, Greg, you can talk to Greg directly about that. Greg, Greg will be your guy to talk to you about that. By the way, the QR codes there on the screen that'll take you directly to their website if you want to just shoot a picture as well. Uh, the Sunrise Movement's here. Raise your hand if you're in the Sunrise Movement. Yeah, big shout out to them back there. We clap for them. Sunrise Movement, a youth-led movement fighting to stop climate change. So check them out back there as well. <coughs> I think we have a representative from 350 Seattle. Yeah, go see them as well. They're a local grassroots movement for climate justice advocating for bold climate legislation. So please talk to them. We have the People for Climate Action. Are you here as well? <laughs> so the People for Climate Action are here. They help local governments achieve their greenhouse gas emission targets. So please go see them about how you can get involved there. How about Audubon, Washington? We got Audubon, Washington here. We got Audubon, Washington. They protect birds and their habitats. We have opportunities for involvement in community organizing around policies to reduce carbon emissions, so go see them. I think we have Nick Turan from whatisnuclear.com. Are you back there, Nick? 
All right, go see Nick if you have questions about nuclear power. They're a group of nuclear engineers looking to teach the world about nuclear energy, so go see him. I think we also have the Cli Citizens Climate Lobby. They're here as well. Big shout out to Citizens Climate Lobby, grassroots organization focused on national policies to address climate change. Last but not least, again, we have the Cascadia Climate Action Table back there. Big shout out to them, not only for putting on this event, but for being here to answer your questions. So please go see them too. I just want to go ahead and put a plug in for our next Climate Science on Tap event. This one won't be until August, but please write down the date. It'll be August 26th at Lagunitas Brewing Company. This will be our Ask a Scientist event. It's a great event that we put on once a year. We get scientists from all walks, shapes, sizes, talk about anything climate related. You can come there and ask your questions directly of those scientists. We usually have anywhere between 30 and 50 different climate scientists and other related fields represented. So please plan on coming to that event. It's also a fundraiser for Cascadia Climate Action. So please get that on your calendar now. I just want to leave you with a quote, another quote from Naomi Orskis. Orskis, I'm sorry. She's, again, the co-author of Merchants of Doubt, professor of Harvard. Uh, she's a history of science professor there. She's asked, I'm constantly asked if I'm an optimist or pessimist about the climate. And I say yes. And really, I think we all kind of have to be both pessimists and optimists. You want to be realists, but I think having constructive hope and being constructively optimistic is really useful as well. And we need to do that if we want to make any sort of progress towards this issue. I mentioned at the outset that I'm a, I'm a teacher. I'm a lecturer at the University of Washington. I teach environmental studies. I teach our seniors. They've been in our program for four years. And I ask them, I give them a poll question at the end of their time in our program. After four years of hearing day in and day out about our problems and potential solutions, I ask them to finish this sentence. The future is so, and, and, and you see, you know, some of them say the future is so bright. Some say bleak. Many say uncertain, but a lot say full of possibilities. And I think that's where we're at. The future is full of a lot of possibilities. And I think we need to keep that optimism going forward. So please take that message with you when you leave here tonight. Talk to our panelists. Talk to the tablers. Have a great night. And I just want to one more time mention to big thank you to our panelists tonight. This week, one big round of applause for our panelists as well. Another huge shout out to the Cascadia Climate Action volunteers. Couldn't put on these events without their help. We clap for them. And last but not least, big shout to Optimism Brewing for giving us this space and for perpetuating that view of optimism to the world. So make sure you have another beer and tip your servers. All right, y'all, have a great evening. Come up and answer, have your questions answered, and we'll see you at the next event.